Morning, church. Is everybody happy? So, when I was a kid, we used to have this saying. If I went, is everybody happy? You, you had to say, I bet your life we are. Well, that's a cockney way. So I'm going to say, is everybody happy? Yeah, good, good. Praise the Lord. Anyone know what today is? It's a special day in the church calendar. What is it? Pentecost, yeah. So this scripture is about the rain coming. So I want a bit of, bit of I want some Pentecost. Anyone want a bit of Pentecost? You know, the good thing about Pentecost, when the Spirit came, he never went back up. So we're going to try and, I want to rekindle your hearts to get more of the Spirit of God in you. And, and I think this is what the story of Elijah is about. So Elijah last week, can we remember what happened? Um, Tom was preaching. I, I think it was the um, big offering, wasn't it? The fire. And um, I think he felt he probably had nailed it by that point. You know, look, you know, I've got the fire, you know, in, in the power of God, he got the fire going. He got rid of all the priests, the dodgy priests. And he thought, finally, we can get some revival going. Get some revival going. So this is where we're at. So this is the next stage of that journey. So he's had, he's had great success. He b killed all the prophets, the false prophets. And he's probably thinking just to himself, I've nailed this. We've got it. We've got this one sussed, you know. He's probably feeling quite high. Um, I would. If it, could you imagine having a day like that, you know? God, God, you've... You've done it. You've brought fire down. You've killed the prophets. Finally, the people are going to see that God is God and they're going to turn their hearts back to him. See, the thing is with God, he's always had this problem. And I think we would experience it as well. But he comes out with a statement like, you know, there's three of us in this relationship. And there can only be two. And I don't share myself with other gods. And the thing is with Ahab, he was, he didn't know, I don't know, he, he, he just weren't getting it that Yahweh was God. Alone, Yahweh was God. So he had his foot in two camps. And, you know, so Elijah was raised up to actually bring about, you know, basically to show that there's only one God. And God was using the people of Israel to reveal that God. And, um, so you've got to get this time frame. It's roughly about 400 years after Moses. So that's roughly about Henry VIII to about now. So Henry VIII is still affecting us as a society in this country even now. So, but it didn't take long for them to start turning and turning to other gods. And this is where we join 1 Kings 18, 41, 46. And Elijah said to Ahab, go and eat and drink, for there's a sound of heavy rain. So Ahab went off and eat, ate and drink, drank. But Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, the mountain, and he bent down to the ground and he put his face between his knees. Go and look towards the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and looked. But there was nothing there. So he said seven times, go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Weren't seeing it for those seven times. But on the seventh time, the servant reported, I, I see a cloud, but it's, a, it's the size of a fist. And it's raised him from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, Hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds and the wind rose and a heavy rain started falling. And Ahab rode off to Jezreel. Yeah, anything else you want to share? <laughs> the power of the Lord came on Elijah. Tucking in his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Uh, Jezreel was about 17 miles away. And I, I, like, I like the way he tucks his, um, 
Yeah, well, we're going to go for this. Do you know how the average speed of a chariot is about 35 miles an hour? So you could argue that Elijah could beat Usain Bolt at a race. But there's one other man that could beat him. Do you know who that was? It's Adam, because he was the first in the human race. Anyway, come away from him. <laughs> you like that? That's my joke for the day. <laughs> But he's, <laughs> let's get back. <laughs> but what I love about Elijah is the Bible in Hebrews, uh, in James says, Elijah was a man just like us. And I've, this verse has always haunted me. Because I think, God, I would, I, wouldn't you like a bit of Elijah? I think we'd like to have his ministry. I'm not sure we would want to have his um, suffering yet. He was, like, he was on the run for years. Uh, people after his life and he, and he was hiding out in deserts then hiding out in women's houses who, who had nothing um, which um, Steve preached on and you know he didn't have it that easy but you just get this feeling with Elijah that God was preparing his heart all along and you know we all want the apostolic ministry but none of us want what you call the apostolic suffering you know, but it is part and parcel. And I'm going to sort of share some stories of why it's part and parcel. Because, unfortunately, uh, I've had the Holy Spirit whispered to me a few times. He said, he's, do you want to turn that rubbish off, mate? <laughs> um, he said, I'm more concerned about your character than I am your comfort. And if, if you ever get that, you know, actually God loves building character he loves building a person um, and making them more like Jesus and that's what it's all about he's into building character in you and not necessarily your comfort and so I don't think Elijah had a, a real comfortable time um, but he did some amazing stuff but he was an ordinary man turn to your neighbor and say you're an ordinary man or woman You are, and Elijah was an ordinary person. He's an ordinary person who just has an extraordinary God be backing him up. And that's what makes Elijah effective. You know, and if you go on to, into the New Testament, you know, you've got Paul and Barnabas, you know, they're doing these miracles, and all of a sudden the crowds start gathering and say, these guys are gods. It's Apollo that's um, come down. And he stops them right there and he said, no, we're men just like you. Just like you. And, you know, it's just like you that God wants to use. Just like you, ordinary men and women that God wants to do extraordinary things with. And this is what, and this is my heart, is that we become a, a people that are, if you like a prophetic people, who, are, who wants to be a world changer? We all want to be a world changer. Uh, let, me, let me tell you something. You want to live for significance. You want to live to leave a mark on yourself. You do. You know, and, and I just finished off with Winston Churchill's book. And uh, one of the things you see with that guy, he didn't care much about his life, but he wanted to leave a mark. And if that meant him dying young, that's fine. I'm, I, he just wanted to leave a mark because he was from a, a, a bun whole bunch of guys in his family that left a mark. And, uh, you know, and they thought, yeah, I'll probably die young anyway. So he wasn't scared about bullets and bombs and stuff. And in fact, he would walk out onto an open field where bullets are flying around. And he's, all his mates would all duck because they would hear these bullets. He said, look, if... If you can hear them, they would have hit you by now. So it's not worth going down on the deck. You know, so he would just carry on. But, you know, he, he lived for purpose and significance. And I believe that every one of us wants to live for purpose and significance. But we all want to seem to have a comfortable life to go with it. But that's not how it works. You know, so the rain came. And, he's, and he says... Um, you know, go off to, to Jezreel. 
And I was just thinking, blimey hell, we've seen some rain this month, haven't we? I think it's a record for at least 20, 25, 26 years. So I want to see the sun come. <laughs> and I, but I'm prophesying in, t in 10 days' time, the sun's going to start coming next week. Okay? Anyway, um, but he's a, ma a man like us. A man like us. But I, I want to tell you the secret of where his prayers come from. So I believe that good, effective prayer is based almost in heaven, kind of. I know you're going to think, what are you talking about? See, I, when I pray, when I get big prayers, they tend to come from heaven. Ever get that? So Jesus says, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, there's a, you know, so we know that God actually, there's stuff he's got for us to do here on earth so one is to seek and save the lost that in my opinion is the mandate for most of us but there's you know that we go we keep on uh, pressing in asking god to uh, seek and save the lost so it comes i think our prayers come from heaven and god gives us an inclination to pray big prayers that's how i've i've i've, I've seen it in my own self and um but there's, there's different sources where we can pray from. So the Bible says in um, Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and the word. So there's two sources of prayer. One is that you hear from God. He shows you how to pray. The other is scripture. That's the revealed heart of God. It's the revealed heart of God. And, um, you know, there's something like, 780, 40, uh, 7,847 promises made by God to us, okay? Um, and altogether, there's 8,810 promises, but promises made by God is, is the first one, you know? And they're promises that God has given to us that we can benefit from. And John don't know this, but as he walked up, I just knew what psalm he was going to read. And I've got that in my notes, this, this psalm. I thought he's going to go and read Psalm 103. And it's forget not my benefits. And uh, I can remember I was up in Limehouse one day and there's this big poster and it says something like six billion pounds worth of benefits go unclaimed every year in this country. Are you entitled to that benefit? And I thought, Psalm 103 forget not his benefits he heals my diseases he cleanses me of my sins these are the benefits we've got and you know there for us you know God is a family man I really believe that and he wants his kids to be involved in prayer and John Wesley actually said God does nothing without prayer so it's such a vital because God wants to say hey kids I want you involved in this sign up to it sign up get to know my heart I want you to do some d exciting stuff here on earth Be, he wants lots of little Elijah's and Jesus's on this planet um, changing the world you know so these are promises um, and benefits we can have and, and see I really believe I've had, I've had some sort of prayers I mean we had some when me and June first got together and asked her to marry me she said yes foolishly <laughs> but it's the best thing she ever did in her life she, fortunately she's gone <laughs> um, we got a marriage date you know we didn't have to postpone it because we didn't have cor coronavirus in those days <laughs> and um, and just before getting married, I thought, Lord, where are we going to live? And uh, the Lord had spoken a verse into my heart, and he said, um, previously, and I never understood it. So he spoke to me, but I, sometimes God speaks to you, and you don't understand what he's talking about, you know. But he had spoke to me, and he said, I want you to be rich towards me. And it's, it's in Scripture, 
um, in the Gospels. And so I read it, and he said to me, read it again. So I read it, didn't understand it. And he said, read it again. So I read it, didn't understand it. Read it again, didn't understand it. So I left it. But I put it, 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 by the time he said it like the fourth, fifth time, it was in my heart, but I didn't understand it, you know. And then I started praying, and I said, and I, and I saying, Father, you know, I, I've got nowhere to bring my bride. And uh, I started weeping, if I'm honest with you. I started weeping before the Lord. I, I, I thought, I'm, what kind of man am I that I can't even provide for my wife, you know. And... Uh, and then the Lord brought that verse up. He said, be rich towards me, son. You know. And uh, to cut along, I've got to tell you the story, because it's a great story. Um, so this was, we got married. We went off on our honeymoon. And we came back from the honeymoon with nowhere to live. And all of a sudden, we're like filling up people's houses while they were going on holiday. And this carried on and carried on. But because I was rich in God, I had this incredible, and June did as well, I had this incredible peace that passes all understanding. And I didn't care a sausage. I really didn't care a sausage. We just had this peace and God just brought us through it. He would spoken, here's our peace. And we was homeless for 12 months. 12 months we just moved from house to house but we didn't care we had each other and, and that was enough we had each other and our Lord that's all we needed and then um, we had all these people being quite concerned about us our church what being one and even housing associations around here were being concerned and they wanted to help us out but God held them back and I've never seen this before. There was, used to be a, um, a housing association called Springboard. And they wanted to give us something. And God said, no, don't, don't touch them. They're mine. This is us. I'm, well, thanks, thanks a lot. Tower Hamlets comes along, offers us a flat. And the Lord says, no, don't touch it. And because I started wanting to vomit when I went into the flat. I thought, I can't, we can't move in here. And our church was really annoyed with us because we're making ourselves deliberately homeless. And then the Lord said to June, oh, I'm going to give you a house anyway, um, you know. So we said, okay, you know, so here we are homeless. And we're walking, this is the truth, I was walking down Marlem Road, we walk past this estate agent, we see a house in the shop window. And something, it leapt out at both of us, and the Lord said, I want to give you that house. And so we went to our friends and we said to the, our friends, oh, we saw this house, we just feel something about it. You will pray with us. And so they prayed with us. And then the Lord spoke to again to us. He says, I'm going to give you the house. Don't do anything. Don't even go to the estate agent. So we didn't. Uh, a week later or two weeks later, a friend of mine comes out. He says, I've seen this house. I just bought it. And immediately I thought of you, if you want to buy the second half of it, because it's a big old townhouse. And without even seeing it, I don't know why, I just said yes. And he said, well, well can you get the money this week? And I had a, got a, a mate of mine, you know. <laughs> I said, could you borrow some money to buy this house, John? He's a millionaire. And he, he was my best mate. It's good to have best mates who are millionaires. <laughs> so try and find a millionaire friend, right? Anyway, we bought the house. He gave me the money. I paid him back. And it was the house that we saw in the estate agent. You know, it's God doing the impossible. Um, you know, so it's, it's a breakthrough. It's a breakthrough. And God is a God of breakthroughs. He's got a breakthrough for you. I want, I want to encourage you. Um, you know, but sometimes... Between the promise and the palace, there's always the process. Between the promise and the palace. The promise is God says, yeah, I will do it. And before you get there, I might want to do a process in, in between because I'm into your character. I want to do something with my kingdom and I've got great opportunity to do this. I had another friend of mine and um, 
I was his mentor. He was. Um, he, does anyone know what CF is? It's cystic fibrosis. And but um, 20 years ago, you were lucky if you made it to 24, and you would die basically. And he'd be, he was a right old hard nut Cockney, but I mentored him, so I was the right sort of person for him. You know. <laughs> so, and we, you know, he really wanted to be healed big time. Really wanted to be healed. And he would go to all the like John Wimber meetings, in Andrew's meetings. He, he went wherever there was a healing meeting because he, he was desperate to get healed. And nothing was happening. And if you like, disappointment started filling his heart, you know. And see, God wants us to be persistent but not obsessed. Yeah? So he wants us to, to have persistent prayers but not. You know, and it, my mate, it started being unhealthy for him to be going to healing meetings. It really is. And I prayed and I said, Father, what are you saying? What are you saying? And give me a word from him. Give me a word. You know, this guy needs a touch from you. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, um, and that was persistent prayer. He spoke to me and he said, tell Mark I'm going to extend his life. Now, CF people don't have extended lives. They they die young and um, and it was the word from um, Hezekiah where he God extended his life and I went out to Mark and I said Mark God's told me that he's going to extend your life I didn't know what that looked like six weeks later he had a heart and lung transplant and he got seven years on his life and he you know he, he gave him good time to get right you know his relationship going with God you know and um, it was just wonderful. But, you know, sometimes you need that prophetic word just to speak into people's lives. And, you know, so we need to be persistent in this sort of stuff. Um, because there is that process going on. There's that process. And uh, just this morning, you know, I don't know, there's something else about prayer. It always involves worship and thanksgiving. Have you, I just noticed this this morning. I was asking the Holy Spirit just to fill me up. I know, and when I ask the Holy Spirit, I don't expect a feeling or anything like that. I just ask for a feeling, not a feeling. And I, I just take it and bluntly, fill me up, Holy Spirit. I, I need your power, I need your power. And one thing that I always realize, it always, you can't help but be filled with the Holy Spirit and filled with thanksgiving and praise. It's a part and parcel. He just always does that to you. And um, so prayer always involves thanksgiving and prayer, you know. Um, you know, so God wants to do, before he changes this world, he wants to change who? You. He, revival needs to start with you. It needs to start with you. And God will plan it in such a way that he, he'll prepare your character like he did with Joseph you know Joseph could make great boasts to his brothers I saw you bowing down to me oh, but God did he go through a process before he got to the palace he prison his brothers tried to kill him but he was a different man at the end of it and his brothers ended up doing um, so he went through that wonderful process of God just refining him and God wants to do that with each of us if we want to be world changers. <clears throat> Where we live, um, and I talked to some of the guys there, we've got, we got the forest at the back of our house, and um, in the middle of the forest is a big stone, and it's, in this stone is a bloke called Gypsy Smith was um, born there. And Gypsy Smith was illiterate, he was a bit of a boy, before he knew the Lord, you know, he did a bit of what you call tinkering and stuff. But he met, he met the Lord. He couldn't even read and write. But God just took hold of this guy. And um, I think it was William Booth took him on. He used to go along to Whitechapel up here. And William Booth called him out and said, you know what, son, I see an evangelist in you. You should be telling people about Jesus. And, you know, he, he weren't that 
articulate or whatever, but he could sing, he could sing well. And he started telling people about Jesus and just hundreds of thousands of people started coming to find Jesus as a result of this, um, this gypsy boy. And, uh, and he was literally only a couple of hundred yards from my house. And um, his, his ashes were under there. And I thought, I sometimes lay my hands on the stone. I say, I'll have some of this, Lord. And then I think, actually, I can go to my risen Jesus and get power from him. That's what, where we can go. We can get to it. We don't need to put a hand on the rock. But I thought, he can be an inspiration to me. And they, do, they, they reckon over a million people came to faith, and most of them stayed, of course. Um, you know, but he was one of these geezers that would um, preach, be preaching, and, and spontaneously, in the middle of the meeting, he'd just start worshipping Jesus in the middle of his preach, because he loved the Lord so much. And people's hearts were um, changed as a result of it. And um, someone asked him, what is the secret? to you know revival and he said he said this when he arrived in a town or a city he had planned an, an evangel evangelistic event smith would stand outside the town or city limits and draw a circle on the ground <clears throat> he would enter that circle and pray not only for revival but for revival to start in his own heart this ritual became such a part of him that when he was asked what the secret was for a successful revival, Smith stated, go home, lock yourself in your room, kneel down in the middle of the floor, get a piece of chalk, draw a circle around yourself, and then on your knees pray fervently and brokenly that God will start a revival within this chalk circle. It starts with you if you want to change the world. And I look at Des, and he's sitting in this circle. I don't think he drew that around him. But that's where the revival needs to start, isn't it, Des? Right there. You need to start drawing circles in your prayer life, saying, God, start revival with me. I want to be a world changer. I want to be a world changer. Because God's going to start with you before he starts with the world. He's going to start with you before he starts with the world. And we, I don't know, we, we've got to get this persistent prayer life going in ourselves and to change this world. You know, um, maybe why don't we just stand? Why don't we all just stand up? And uh, I, I really, my heart is that something, I'd, you know, we could do hermeneutics. Is that the word? Hermeneutics? And then the study of scripture. But actually, we want to walk off with something today, don't we? We want to walk off with um, God starting a revival in us. And maybe just where you are, draw that circle around you. And say, Lord, would you start a revival in this circle? And then, and from me, touch my family, touch my neighbours, touch my community, touch my world. And may I make a real difference while I'm alive, Lord. May I live for significance for the kingdom of God to advance. And we, we just want more of you, Lord. We want more of you. And start a revival here. In this heart, Lord. And may we be inspired by people who are ordinary people like Elijah, just like us, and Paul and Barnabas. We're men just like you and become world changers, Lord. We thank you for these guys, Lord. But would you use us, Lord, to extend your kingdom and your will to be done on earth through us? Amen. <laughs>